I think most of us feel like uh, in certain aspects of, of either our jobs, the way we do things at our homes, um, you know, different projects, things like that, there's, there's the right way to do things and there's everybody else's way, right? Some of y'all know exactly what I'm talking about. There's my way or the wrong way. So, you know, like maybe there's some things in, that you're like, this is the way it's got to be done, this is the way it's got to look. I've shared with this church family before, I'm convinced that there's a right way to load the dishwasher and there's everybody else in my family's way of loading the dishwasher. And one of these days they're going to get it right, right? Uh, when it comes to mowing, to weed eating, those things, you know, those kind of things, there's a way to do it right and there's a way, well, not to do it, a, a different way to do it, but there's a right way to do it. Um, maybe, well, I sh I'll share this with you. We're in the process now, and just kind of as a, more to make a point, but also to let our church family know, uh, starting just this past week, uh, we have added uh, more hours and more areas of responsibility to Lori Glenn's job description, and she is now uh, administrative professional, I guess, uh, in our office, uh, and, and is going to be doing those types of things, you know, administrative, secretarial type of things for us on a regular basis. So one of those things is taking care of the weekly church bulletin. So I was showing her how to do that this week. And of course, there's the right way to do it. And then, <clears throat> you know, she was, she got the hang of it. I mean, we're going to work on it. You got, you got things like that, right? There's things that I'm meticulous about this. And, and I didn't, I promise I didn't do this to Lori, but, the, but you, maybe you've experienced this before, or maybe you've done it to somebody else before, where you're almost standing behind somebody and just watching them be like, yeah, you're not doing that right. Anybody ever had that experience? Anybody ever had somebody stand over your shoulder and you know in their mind the whole time they're going, mm, that's not it. That's not right. You're not doing that right. Okay. Now, I, I want you to be thinking about that. Maybe, maybe there's some things um, that you have done and you've wondered, am I doing this right? You've, you almost have some anxiety like, I don't know if, I, if this is the way it's supposed to go. I don't know if I'm doing this the right way. Our church, we planted this church eight years ago. And in the old building that we used to rent, we had to finish, you know, um, putting in some ceiling tiles and painting some walls, and, and we were hanging things up for our kids' classes. And um, I remember Brian Bailey and some other guys and I were working on uh, hanging some things, you know, some bulletin boards and whiteboards and things in different, in different uh, classrooms for our kids. And uh, they were working on a project. He and two or three other guys were working on something in our worship area. And so... Uh, you know, we're, he's like, well, why don't you go hang up that, that whiteboard, just a small uh, whiteboard in one of the classrooms. And I'm like, ah, man, I don't know. And he's like, screw the thing into the wall. You're good. You know, I'm like, okay. And I, and I went and I, and I took this drill and I'm finding where the stud was with the stud finder and I'm, and I'm drilling a hole in this wall and I come back and I'm like, I think I hit the stud and I'm positive. And Brian's like, okay, you'll be fine. And then I, I you know, I get things, it's, it's kind of level. I think it's level. I think we had measured already, but I, I go through this whole process and I probably went in five different times to tell him, what do you think about this? And I'm not sure, was this the right screw? And did I do this right? And he's like, just hang the whiteboard. But there was part of me that was so anxious. Am I doing this right? What if I mess up? What if the first Sunday, some teacher puts the marker on the board and the whole thing just collapses and kids start crying and nobody comes back to church anymore? I mean, those are the kind of things that are going through my mind. Am I doing this right? And the point is, the, the, the reason I'm bringing this up is sometimes we think we're doing something right and somebody comes along and says, uh, no, that's not it. And then we feel guilty. We feel bad. We feel frustrated. We might feel a little angry towards them. Like, who are you to tell me that's not the right way to do things? And then sometimes we get anxious, wondering, am I doing this right? Is, is somebody going to say something? Is somebody going to be upset about what I'm doing, about the job that I'm doing? And the, the, I almost said the weirdest thing, but it shouldn't be this way, and yet often it is. One of the times we have that kind of anxiety or we get told we're not doing something right, is when we worship. And when we come before God, praising Him, praying to Him, experiencing His presence, and, and yet we can feel like, especially depending on what kind of church uh, we grew up in, what kind of church experience we've had in the past, or what somebody else's experience has been and they're comparing to us, we can have this anxiety, this frustration, this wondering, am I doing it right? I mean, 
We have a lot of different church backgrounds represented in this room. We're not at all Church of Christers, at least not born and bred like I was. And so you, even within people within the, the Church of Christ denomination, I mean, we got all these questions. Do I, do I stand? Do I sit? Do I kneel? Do I raise my hands? Do I keep my hands down? Do I do kind of a halfway kind of thing? Do I clap? Do I not clap? Can I say something to the preacher? Can I even just, I mean, do I, do I need to make it sound uh, religious to say amen when he says something I like? Or, do, or can I be a little bit more informal, like, that's right, or yeah, or I like it, or wrap it up? What can I call out to the preacher? I've had this conversation. I'm going to call you out, Shavar. You and I have had this conversation before. What are we allowed to say? What, sometimes I want to be more expressive. Sometimes I want to say something. Or am I, is somebody going to think I'm not doing it right? My dad preached at a church on just occasions in Fort Smith where he said all he had to come up with was about 10 minutes stuff to say because people were saying, he'd say a phrase. And then the Lord said, and then it was like a whole minute. of People were like, that's right, bring it. You know, and then he'd say this next phrase. Is that the right way to do it? It makes a difference. It makes a difference when we stop worrying about, when we stop focusing on whether we're doing it right or not, and when we just worship from the heart. And I'm not being critical of anybody here this morning. If you worship from the heart and you had your hands in your pockets the whole time, or your hands full in your lap, and you poured your heart out in praise to God, praise God for that. If you wanted to lift your hands, if you wanted to clap, if you wanted to close your eyes, if you wanted to kneel, and you did that from the heart, not because of what anybody else thought, praise God for that. I'm glad for it. And what I want us to be thinking about, what I want us to at least have in the back of our mind this morning, as we, as we look at this, this famous prayer of Jesus, is this, this question that we wrestle with all the time of, is this right? Am I doing it right? Is this pleasing? And, and seeing how Jesus kind of cut through all of that when he talked about prayer. That's what we're going to do this morning. So if you've got your Bibles, your Bible, can you, just a quick question. I know this is going to be on the video and everything. Can y'all see this bug that's flying around? I'm being attacked by a gnat up here and with the lights and stuff. It's just, so when I'm preaching today, if I all of a sudden do this kind of thing, it's not the Holy Spirit. Not, I don't know. Maybe it is. I don't know. But, I didn't know if y'all could see that or not. Okay, maybe we can edit that part out of the video. I don't know. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 5. Ma actually, Matthew chapter 6. So we're going to be this morning. So if you got your Bibles, open to there. If you don't know where that's at, look at your table of contents. It's about the halfway point uh, in, in the books of the Bible. Uh, it's the first book of what we call the New Testament. And there are four different books that were written that give the story of the life of Jesus. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. This is the first one of those. So if you go to Matthew and look at chapter 6, you're right in the middle of a long sermon that Jesus uh, preached, the longest single sermon that we have recorded in Scripture. And it's Matthew 5, 6, and 7. If we, if we took the time to read through Matthew chapter 5, you'd see that Jesus spent some time using this phrase over and over. You've heard that it was said, but I say this. And he's going back to phrases from the Old Testament, from, from the Jewish uh, law, and saying you've heard that it was that it was said, that it was taught, that it was preached, this particular thing. But I tell you, here's what God really meant by that. And he goes through and he talks about, he talks about anger and he talks about lust and he talks about keeping our word and, and all these different things, saying there's, there's all these rules that you heard and, and, and kind of these laws, and those got kind of tweaked into something that God never intended, intended them to be in the first place. But what I want to tell you is what God really intended. That's most of Matthew chapter 5. We get into Matthew chapter 6, and he starts talking about how we serve, how we meet the needs of other people, and the attitude that we do that with. And he says, you know, when you go give to somebody, when you go do something nice for somebody else, don't even do that. Like, be so secretive about it that your right hand doesn't know what your left hand is doing. That you're not doing it for fanfare. You're not doing it to get a pat on the back. You're just doing it because it needs to be done. And he talks about, uh, he, he talks about doing you know, prayer as we're going to talk about. And he talks about even taking oaths and, and really just keep your word. And, 
and do what you say you're going to do. There's all these different things in Matthew chapter 6 that Jesus is addressing the heart with which we do things. In the middle of that conversation, in the middle of that part of the sermon, he says this in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 9. He says, this then is how you should pray. Now to us, that, may not, that phrase may not mean that much. It may not mean a whole lot for Jesus to go, okay, now this is how you're going to pray. And we're like, okay, well, tell me how to pray. It was a big deal for Jesus to utter this to the crowd that he was with. Let me explain why. Jesus is in the middle of a Jewish culture. And the rabbis, the, the teachers and the religious leaders of, of Jesus' day would teach people how to pray. How to pray in a way that God would, would accept it. And, you know, if you, again... I know I'm different than a lot of people in this room. I grew up going to church. My dad was a preacher. My mom was a Sunday school teacher. I, I don't remember not knowing how to pray. Now, has it gotten better over the years? I think so. But I'm saying just the, the, the do's and the don'ts that you learn as a kid, I learned those. There were people who didn't know how to pray, and these rabbis would teach them. Not just the words to say, but, but what you should look like in the process. I mean, how many different opinions do we have on that? Should you bow your head? Can you keep your head up? Can you look up? Can you cl- do you need to close your eyes? What if you don't close your eyes? What if you open them part of the way through? Does prayer not count anymore? Should we do our hands like this, like this, like this, like this, like this? Should we join hands? Oh, that's going to make people uncomfortable. Let's not do that. Should we kneel? Should we stand? Should we sit? Should- We've got a lot of different opinions on how to pray, don't we? Back in Jesus' day, you, even if you were just talking about the prayer postures, there were different ways to present your body to God as you prayed. So one would just be standing. I'd be, I'd be standing as I pray, maybe even looking up to heaven. And it's almost carrying the concept of standing like a, like a soldier, uh, ready, you know, awaiting orders from his commander. I'm talking to God, and I'm awaiting his response, and I want to do whatever it is that he calls me to do. Or... Along with that, or separate from that, you can have your arms stretched out. Palms out would be a common way to pray. You have your palms out, and this would be this would carry the concept of, you know, if you were lifting something up over your head, you're lifting, you're you're lifting praise to God, you're lifting your prayers to God. Or if you can think about um, um, kind of honoring someone, and you're, you know. We, we used to do it at sporting events where somebody gets a really good dunk in a basketball game. Oh, right. Same kind of concept. We are lifting our praise. We are directing our praise to God. Palms out. Or we can switch it and do palms in. And it can be like this, palms facing each other, or palms facing this way. And this concept right here is, is uh, used for us to, to say, I'm ready to receive, God, whatever it is that you're going to give. I'm praying to you, I'm asking you to do things for me, and I'm going to receive whatever the answer is. Then there was kneeling. And you could, you could just be on your knees straight up like this, but most often in the Jewish culture, you would at least bow your head. And soldiers would do this when they were captured by another army, and they were brought before that prince or that king, and you, and you bow your head and it leaves your neck exposed. It's a very subservient uh, attitude, and it's basically telling this person, do with me what you will. My neck is exposed. You can cut my head off if you want to. I am your servant now. I am in your control. And so to pray to God, to have this posture when you're, when you're talking to God was to say, God, I am kneeling before you. I surrender to your will. Whatever you want, you call the shots. I, I'm surrendering to you. They would even sometimes go all the way down, you know, bend all the way down with their faces to the ground. I'm not going to do that for you because I don't think I can. They would bend with their faces to the ground. Some, some would even go so far as to, and when you see in the Bible, sometimes it says they lay prostrate before God. They would completely stretch out all the way, arms stretched out, face down like this, and be praying to God. Okay? Laugh if you want to. That's how they prayed. That's how people over in Eastern culture still pray sometimes. And in completely laying themselves on the ground, they are completely laying all of themselves before God. God, I'm completely giving myself in this, in this praise to you, in this conversation with you, and in, in whatever way you're going to answer this prayer. I am completely giving you everything that I am. 
And the people of Jesus' day, Jesus day would, would use these different postures at different times when they prayed, or they used combinations of those things. And all these were perfectly acceptable, both in public worship and in private worship. And then you had, you know, the right words. They would pray through, there's a book of the Bible called the Psalms. They would pray some of those songs, the words of those songs. They had certain phrases they would use. There were uh, Jewish and Hebrew uh, prayer books. And you could re read through those out loud, or you could recite something, you know, memorize them and recite them. There were all these different, you know, phrases to use to pray. Most good religious Jewish people of Jesus' day, three times a day would pray what was called the Amida, which is a Hebrew word for the 18. It was 18 different phrases that they would pray to God. And some of them were in praise to him, and then parts of them were asking whatever it was that you were asking for. And, and um, three times a day, morning, midday, evening, you were supposed to stop whatever you were doing, and you were supposed to pray the Amida. And then there were extra phrases that we get added sometimes for funerals or for weddings or for certain holidays and festivals. And then these rabbis would teach abbreviated versions of the Amida, of the 18. So you might only learn about nine of them, but it might be the nine or ten of the most important ones, at least that particular rabbi would think. Or we give you shortened, condensed versions. If you had a hard time memorizing all these long sentences, you could get kind of some keywords. As a matter of fact, the prayer that we're going to look at has some similar phrases to some of the things that are mentioned in the Amida. The reason I'm sharing all this with you is because I want you to see how concerned Jesus' followers would have been with how to pray. He's their rabbi. They're his disciples. He's following them. There's this crowd of people that's following him. And when Jesus stops and says, okay, this is how you should pray, everything would stop. The disciples would lean in. They, if somebody didn't hear it, would be nudging each other. Hey, Jesus is going to teach us how to pray. Pay attention. Take some notes. Our rabbi is going to show us how to pray and how to do it right. This is going to be the right way to, to pray. If they had tuned out, they were going to tune back in because they were desperate to know, am I doing this right? Is God pleased with what I'm saying? Is God pleased with how I look while I'm, while I'm praying? Is there a way to do it better? That was their mindset. I want you to put yourself in their mindset when Jesus says this phrase. Before he even gets into what we call the Lord's Prayer, when he, when he says, this is how you should pray, everybody tuned in. What does this rabbi say is the right way to pray? And then Jesus utters these words, beginning in verse 9 of Matthew chapter 6. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we have also forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. How many of y'all, show of hands, could have recited that without it even being on the screen? Yeah. It's probably the most famous prayer that there is. It's, it's one that you've probably heard many times, maybe recited it many times. And, and this is what Jesus points to. This is what Jesus says it needs to look like when we pray. This is how we pray. But what I want you to see this morning is that there's more to his example of praying than just these words. And, and I want to give you some, kind of what I think Jesus is getting at before we get into these different phrases of, of how to do this right. And as I said before, he's, he's spending a lot of time in Matthew chapter 5 and chapter 6 and chapter 7 giving people a clearer picture of who God is and what God expected of his people. And before he even says, this is how you should pray, he's already talking about prayer. So back up a few verses. I'll show you what Jesus says about prayer before he ever gets to the words. Look at verse 5. He says, when you pray, don't be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues on the street corners to be seen by others. But when you pray, this is in verse 6, when you pray, go into your room and close the door and pray to your Father who is in heaven. Now, you remember all the posture I talked about, standing, arms, hands in, out, kneeling, laying out. There are people who would do those things 
in the church building. That's what the synagogue was back then. They would do those things in the church building so that people would be impressed with their posture. Like I said, I have a hard time kneeling and putting my face on the ground at the same time. That would take me a minute to kind of contort my body to do that. If you could do that in an instant, ooh, look at that guy, man. That, he must kneel like that a lot. Somebody laying completely out flat and praying to God, oh, that guy's holy. Look at that guy. And that's why they would pray that way. And so they could hear the comments from other people, I wish I could be as holy as that person. I wish I could pray like him. I wish I could be like her. They, they prayed as a, well, as a performance for other people. And what Jesus says here is, your prayers to God and your connection with God should be about humility, not performance. Because prayer, prayer really isn't about me. It's really about him. If any, if any part of prayer has to do with me, it is me recognizing how much I don't deserve to come before the creator of the universe with whatever it is that's on my heart, and yet he lets me come anyway. It's me acknowledging there are things in my life that I wish were different, and I can't do anything about it. I don't have the strength. I don't have the talent. I don't have the wisdom. I don't have the ability to make this happen. I'm going to have to depend on you, God. That's all that prayer has to do with me. The rest of it is all about him. I need to be about humility and not performance. Jesus tells a story of two guys going to the church building to pray. One of them was a Pharisee, a religious leader, a preacher of the day. One of them was a tax collector. This story is found in Luke chapter 18. Both of them go to the church building. It's time to worship. Both of them uh, get ready to worship, and they spend time in prayer. And the Pharisee, Jesus says, gets up. This is in Luke chapter 18, beginning in verse 11. He stands up by himself, and meaning that he stood up kind of in a place where he could be above everybody else and kind of stand out away from everybody else. And he prays, God, I thank you that I'm not like other people, robbers, evildoers, adulterers. And even, he even points the finger, even like this tax collector over here. I fast twice a week and give a tenth of all, uh, of all I get. And this... This churchgoer, this, this preacher, this religious person has just made prayer all about him. His prayer to God is, God, man, you did a great job making me. Congratulations, Lord. I'm not like all these other people that have jacked up lives. That's not me, God. I got my act together. Matter of fact, I go above and beyond. And look at the attitude that he says this with. It's about his performance. He's standing by himself away from everybody else. Why? So that everybody else can see him. Look at me. And it's all about me. Jesus says his tax collector, this guy that collected taxes and cheated people, and people just hated him. He moves over to the side. It says in verse 13, he, he can't even bring himself to look up to God. So he just started beating his chest. Saying, my God, be merciful to me. I'm just a sinner. There's no excuses. He's not rationalized. He's not saying, God, I sinned, but here's really what happened. And here's the... Here's the, the, the thing that happened that time. And I know that was bad, but I'll try to make up for it next time. There's no rationalization. There's no, there's no trying to, to find a loophole out of it. This man is coming for God completely humble and saying, God, I know I don't even deserve to talk to you right now. Is there any way that you can have mercy on me even though I don't deserve it? Jesus tells a story and he says, that's the kind of prayer my God is looking for. Why? Because it's about humility. It's about humbling himself. It wasn't about performance. It had nothing to do with him. It had everything to do with the grace of his God. That's what God is looking for when we pray as well. Not our performance, not comparing ourselves to other people and seeing if we're doing it more right than somebody else. 
but humble. The second thing that he says in verse 7, I'll, I'll try to move a little more quickly. He says in verse 7, When you pray, don't keep on babbling like pagans, for they think they'll be heard because there are many words. In Roman mythology of the Roman Empire that was in control when Jesus was on this earth, there were, there were certain festivals and certain worship practices when you prayed to these gods and goddesses. There were certain prayers you had to pray. You had to pray those prayers in just a certain way. You had to say certain phrases. And you had to say them in the right order. And you had to include all the gods and goddesses that you were praying to, but you had to include them in the right order as well. Otherwise, the gods wouldn't hear your prayer and they wouldn't respond to it. Matter of fact, there's an ancient... Roman historian that talked about being in, in a city and, and the city magistrate was, they were having this festival and he was leading a prayer, uh, praying to some gods or goddesses and he, and he left out the phrase of them to bless all Roman people or something like that and he had to start over so that he got it right. That same mentality existed in the Jewish people that Jesus walked around with as well. You had to say these phrases correctly. You had to do them in just the right order. You could add other stuff, add it towards the tail end, but make sure you get all, of this, all these words right. You, now, I mean, nowadays, you may have heard lots of just eloquent prayers going to church, and it almost makes you feel bad if you don't pray like that. If I don't use those big words, and if, if I don't end every other word in if somehow, it's, it doesn't count. If it, if it doesn't sound King James, it's not holy enough. And I, I say that I don't... I, Jesus said, when you pray, God is much more fo focused on your heart, not your words. Your heart, not your words. Does that mean that it's wrong? to use big, beautiful language when we pray? Absolutely not. As long as it's coming from the heart. My dad prays some of the most beautiful prayers in the world. He uses lots of big words, doesn't he? There's sometimes they're like, man, I don't even know what he prayed about, but it sounded really good. <laughs> but he's not doing it as a performance. That's the way my dad prays. And it is so sincere and passionate the way he talks to God. There's nothing wrong. Jesus isn't saying it's wrong to use big words or, or wrong to use a lot of words. As long as it's coming from your heart. Don't just keep spouting words because that's what you think people want to hear or what you're supposed to do. Pray from your heart because that's what God's more concerned about. I had a, years ago in my youth ministry days, I had a teenager who could pray beautiful prayers. We were, we were at a retreat with a whole bunch of other youth groups one time, and he led a prayer, and one of the other youth ministers came up to him and goes, man, when that kid prays, the angels take notes. Like, I mean, you're just beautiful. But you know what? Some of the choices that he was making, some of the things that he was doing with his life were far from what God wanted from him. And his prayers sounded beautiful, but it wasn't, really where his heart was. God addressed that with his own people. In Isaiah chapter 29, he says, these people come near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. You can say all the right phrases and do things the right way and, and say things in eloquent ways, but they're nothing but empty, meaningless words that they don't come from the heart. And Jesus said, when you talk to God, don't just talk, Share. Open your heart. Be sincere. Be honest. That's what God's wanting from you. He goes on in verse 8 with this phrase. He says, don't be like them, talking about the people that he's, that he's just gotten done talking about. He says, don't be like them, but for your father knows what you need before you ask him. It's an odd thing for Jesus to say. If God knows what I'm going to ask for, I ask him, then why am I asking if he knows what I need before I even ask him for it, then he should just give it to me, right? Why am I even, what's the purpose of praying? Part of the reason God wants us to pray is because God, is because God wants a relationship with us. He wants us to connect with him. He wants us to be, he, he wants to be an important part of our lives. Prayer to God in Jesus' day, and, and probably even nowadays for some folks, 
was just, it was often about just reciting phrases and, and going through the motions and doing the routine, and it was just lifeless and, and, and repetitious. Let's just get it done. Let's say, let's say the right phrases the right way, and let's move on. That's never what God wanted from his people. God was never as concerned with us doing things a certain way as he was with us doing things to gain a connection with him. Jesus said the reason that, that, that God wants us to pray with him, wants us to change our mentality about how we pray with him, is because he doesn't want us to see prayer as a checklist, but rather as a connection. It's a way to connect with him. It's a way to share with him. It's not just a checklist of phrases to make sure we get it done. Because that connection is what God has always wanted with his people. You go back to the very beginning of the Bible, the very first book, the book of Genesis, and you read about the creation of the, uh, of the universe and the creation of us. And God creating Adam and Eve and putting them in the garden. And in, in Genesis chapter 3, it talks about how Adam and Eve messed that up. And that's a sermon for another time. There's one sentence in there that I want to pay special attention to this morning. It's in Genesis chapter 3, verse 8. After they've messed up, after they're, trying, they're scared to death of what God's going to do to them, and they're hiding from them, it says that God, uh, the man and his wife, heard the sound of the Lord as he, as he was walking through the garden in the cool of the day. What an amazing experience that must have been. This is a regular occurrence that Adam and Eve would be able to, to physically see and walk with and talk with God. That he is walking, this, that somehow his presence was here on this earth, walking with them and talking with them. And the reason that he did that, that's why he created us in the first place, was to have that time and that connection and that relationship. God did not create us to be robots, to always do everything that he said, no matter what. God created us with the freedom to choose what we want to do and hopefully to choose him. And the process of choosing him and being in a relationship with him is being connected to him. And that's what prayer does for us. Jesus says, God does not want you to go through the checklist of phrases to do it right just to say you've done it. Just to go, yep, said that, said that, said that, said that. Forgive us for all our many sins, daily bread. Got it. And move on with our lives. Jesus says, God already knows what you need before you even ask. God just wants to talk. Let's connect. Let's be in a relationship. Let's share. Talk to me about what's on your heart. I already know what's on your heart, but I want to hear it from you. I want you to share with me. I want you to talk to me. Folks, that's what prayer is all about. That's what God has always wanted, was to be able to walk with and talk with and share with us. It's what he created us for from the very beginning. Jesus says, if you want to know how to pray, you start off by recognizing that God wants prayer to be more than just a random item on a Christian to-do list. God wants prayer to be a vital part of an intimate connection with him. That's how you do it right. That's how you do it the way that God wants it done. That's how you pray like Jesus. Jesus was always humble when he talked to God, and he prayed from the heart. And he obviously used that time as a connection with God. And so that's what we're going to do for the next few weeks. And I appreciate your attention this morning. We're about to wrap it up. We're going through this series that we're calling Pray Like Jesus, and we're going to look at different parts of, of this Lord's Prayer, this prayer that he shares in Matthew chapter 6. And we're going to look at different phrases from it and, and kind of dig into those and, and find out exactly what it was that Jesus was talking about when he said, this is, this is what it needs to look like when you pray. And you may be thinking to yourself, man, it's... It's been a long time, if ever, since I've prayed with humility and, and, and seeking connection. It's been a long time, if ever, since I've given that much effort to my connection with God. There's a story that's told in Mark chapter 10 of a blind man. His name was Bartimaeus, and he's sitting by the side of the road, and Jesus comes walking by with this huge crowd of people. And Bartimaeus sat there on a regular basis. I mean, people even knew what his name was. And every day he would sit there and he would ask for help. 
He'd probably call out a uh, little help, gold for the blind. You know, he had different catchphrases that he would use. And people would pass him by. Maybe somebody would give him something, but a lot of people would just pass by, not even really paying attention to him. We do the same kind of thing nowadays. But he hears that Jesus is coming. He's heard about Jesus, and he starts crying out. When he hears the crowd get close, he starts yelling, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And there's people in the crowd going, Barnabas, shut up. We're trying to hear Jesus. We can't hear him over you screaming. And he screams even louder, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And I want you to, I want you to understand what he's really asking. Jesus, all these other people pass by me on a regular basis and never see me. Do you see me? Can you see me, Jesus. Jesus says, bring him here. And they bring Bartimaeus to Jesus. And Jesus says, what do you want me to do for you? And in Mark chapter 10, verse 51, he says, Jesus, I, I want to see. Obviously, he wants to be able to physically see. But I, I read a little bit more into that, I guess. Because I think there's part of, of, of Bartimaeus that goes, Jesus, I, I want to see you. And I want to know that as I see you, I want to know that you see me. That I'm not just a bum on the side of the road, that you see me and see my heart. Folks, that's a prayer. That's a prayer that all of us can pray. Almighty God, can you see me? Can you see what's on my heart? God Almighty, I want to see you. I want to see you better than I did today. I want to see you better than I did yesterday. I want to recognize the connection. And so that's what we're going to work on together the next several weeks. Seeing Jesus through our prayer. Knowing that he's seeing us. And as we wrap up this morning, we're going to stand together. We're going to sing as we always do. And I would invite you. If you're sitting there this morning going, man, it's been a long time since I've had that kind of a connection with God. Today's the day to change that. You're welcome to come forward and say, I want to start seeing Jesus. I want to start seeing him in my life. And I want, I want to know. I want to not just guess, not just hope. I want to know that he sees me and that he sees my heart and that he's a part of my life. And we will pray about that and we will help you make that connection. We want to help if we can. Let us know how while together we stand and sing.